And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Angela Harris, director of IONS Groups and Events. Angela had a near-death experience where she met her soul family, had a life review, and more, which we're going to talk about today. Angela, thank you for joining us, and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for all that you do, Jeff, sharing all of these different stories and connecting everything in such a beautiful way. Thank you. I'm going to share my near-death experience today, and um, as I talk about it, it's from my own point of view. It's what I experienced, and I want to share it here and add it to this collective of information, and I'm hoping that you'll connect in some way to what I say and find hope and validation in the experience that I had. Everyone has a different experience. Hope that you can find a thread in mine. So my experience started during a medical test in a hospital. I was on a tilt table. A tilt table is designed to hold you still so that you don't move while you're on it. And then your body and your brain have to work together. So to keep your blood pressure up and keep you from passing out, you have to fully make the connection between brain and body through your nerves. You can't wiggle around and get your blood pressure to come up that way. Well, I did not do well on that, that tilt table test. Um, my husband was able to watch my vital signs on the monitors. He was sitting behind the doctor and uh, able to see the screen and able to see me. He said that I just became more and more pale. And eventually at 18 minutes, I lost consciousness. I had seizures and I died on the tilt table. At that particular instance, I was feeling so terrible. My mind was mush. I mean, my oxygen to my brain was so little before that, that um, I really had no, my body wasn't telling me anything about how terrible I was feeling. I just suddenly popped out of my body and it, it, it very, very fast. I mean, when I talk about it, it takes way longer to say it than it actually occurred in. I popped out of my body, literally like my face came out of my body at the same time, the nurse is getting up and walking through me. I'm turning, but you know, I don't know how you turn, but I did. And I looked at myself in the face. So I was looking right at myself and thinking, who's that? <laughs> it's like, I didn't recognize my face at first, but then I started to have that recognition of, oh, that's Angela. I turned and looked at my husband and all, kind of all in the same, so popping out, turning around, or using 360 vision, viewing myself, viewing my husband, and then moving backwards into the corner. So moving up to the left of the corner of the room, like I'm being pulled from what would have been my body's back. I could see the room, I could see the doctor, I could see the nurse who had been sitting in a chair in front of me. I could see my husband get up, see the doctor put his hand out to keep my husband from going to me on this tilt table. And then I was in the velvety black void. Um, so in that time of moving through the room in this out of body experience, I, didn't really realize what was happening. I just was seeing what was going on. I knew that I loved my husband very much. My heart felt that, my heart went out to him, but I didn't make a cognizant, you know, I didn't think to myself, that's my husband, Scott. I didn't think to myself, that's the doctor, that's the nurse. I just felt love for them. Um, I did recognize, wow, I feel so good because the pain was gone. I didn't really realize until that moment how much pain my body had been in for so long, just wearing the body, but also this illness that I had been living through for a very, very long time and I wasn't aware of. 
So there was the release of the pain, a moment of, you know, it feels so good. And then I was in the velvety black void. Um, when I entered the velvety black void, I was right alongside uh, my soul guide, my uh, life guide, I think is a better term. Um, connected with her. Her name is Melanie. I talk with her every day now in a much more direct way after my experience. In that moment, though, in my near-death experience, I knew that I knew this person that was next to me, this entity. She presented as female. She had long, dark hair. She had, you know, a conventionally beautiful face with these beautiful eyes that were more lit than uh, human eyes when you look at them. She was carrying a book um, and wearing a, a flowing dress. And we were just walking along, if you will. You know, I didn't have a body, but we were had this feeling of moving forward that many people do in this experience in the void. And we were just talking. It was a continuation of a conversation that we had been having. So it wasn't a conversation that started in that moment. And that's how I really made that connection of, oh, you know, we know each other. This is not, you're not new. This is not a moment where we're meeting and greeting each other. She's always been there with me. We continued forward and, you know, again, like popping out of my body, it was all very fast and it takes much longer to talk about it. Um, I could see up ahead a glimmer of light and an opening in the void, if you will. And then we quickly were there and it was much more like entering, I liken it to riding on a subway. So when you think of being in a subway and you're riding along and you're in the darker part of the tunnel and you enter the station where the light is, at least for me, it feels more like the light comes over you like this, you know, like you're on the train and you're entering and it comes over you rather than like walking into a room. It was like slipping into a vessel. So um, as we were approaching it, it grew larger and larger, uh, but still maintained an outer rim until that moment of descending through it. Um, all different colors of white, cream, bright white, silvers, grays, you know, little tinges of mustard in there. It was beautiful and sparkly, but not glittery. <laughs> and uh, then suddenly I was in this space of white light. So no garden, no buildings, no sky, no floor, no earth below me. I did not feel as if I was standing on anything. I also didn't feel so much like I was Floating. There was no buoyancy there. Um, and that white space was like a fog, you know, not something that you could touch. It was tangible, but bright, but not hurting your eyes um, and soft. And right there in front of me was just this crowd of people and at the front were the people that I knew in this life very well. So my grandparents and uncle, other people that I recognized, a couple of friends from high school, um, but just I could see and feel past that more and more souls. And I just knew, you know, when I would look in a direction at a soul, I knew and I would connect and remember who that was and the importance, not just in this life, but in past lives too. And a very interesting, you know, moments were happening as I was greeting them. So we were able to hug each other in a physical form, put our arms around each other, 
touch our necks together and have that kind of giraffe hug moment. And as we would do that, as I would look in their eyes to greet them, as we would hug, this flood and rush of our life together would come back. And we weren't separate. We were one. It was a singular memory where our souls were not, it wasn't me remembering and them remembering. It was a melding. It was, I was my grandparents and my grandparents were me. I was my uncle. My uncle was me. So here's um, one of the memories that I had. So as I hugged my uncle, I very much vividly remember everything about it. We were at my uncle and aunt's house. My uncle was married to my aunt, who was my mother's sister. And they lived on a farm and they had goats. I could smell the goats. I could smell the hay. I felt the warmth of the sun. I could see the barn and almost hear it, the house, all the people, everything that was going on, the barbecue grill behind me. I was there again, fully and completely. And my uncle had just gotten a motorcycle and I'd never been on a motorcycle and he really wanted to take me on a ride on his motorcycle. And I said, sure, I'll go on the motorcycle. But internally, I, I was scared. I didn't want to ride on the motorcycle so much. I mean, I did. It was exciting. It was new. I wanted to try it. But also, you know, as a child, I had some fear in there. So we got on the motorcycle and they lived at the top of the hill and we were driving on the street. So they lived up here and the road went in front of it kind of like this. And we were driving down the hill and there were lots of trees. And it was one of those dappled sunshine afternoons where I'm riding on the back of the motorcycle, holding on to my uncle. And I'm remembering that moment, but at the same time, I'm my uncle and I'm viewing it from his standpoint. And I had, I don't know, we made it maybe a half a mile, probably not even that far. <laughs> and I, I just didn't want to be on it anymore. I was terrified. There was a corner coming up. I didn't know what that was going to mean for me, what I fall off. And so um, we ended up ending the ride. And in that moment, I felt his disappointment in that. And it's very interesting. He wasn't disappointed in me. He was disappointed that he, he asked me to get on the motorcycle, even though he had those clues for me that I was scared to do it. So that was his disappointment. Um, and we just turned around and we went back to the farm. But, you know, that's, for me, a really good example for how that greeting moment went for me, that it was joyous and love-filled and um, a remembering of my life as Angela, a remembering of their lives and a coming together and an understanding of how we're all one experiencing things together. And we were able to make that connection as we greeted each other. And I did feel a lot of that, you know, uh, just overwhelming blissful love. That's, that's the core of what's there just reconnecting and remembering that's who we, who we are, this general sense of love. So I got to relive a lot of memories through that. And it was really only then that I really came to terms with, wow, I, I think I'm dead. <laughs> In this moment, I think of my family at home and behind me only you don't necessarily need to turn because it's the 360 vision, but it feels to me here in my body now, like it was behind me, these portals opened up and I was able to see my husband in the hospital room and I was able to see my children. They were with uh, their grandparents and I was able to see, I have two children at that time, like 10 years old and um, six years old. 
The 10 year old is sitting on the floor, the six year old is on the 10 year old's lap. And it was a very interesting moment because I was able to see my children as their adult selves. So um, when I would look at them, so I'm going to talk about my oldest child first. I saw her face, her beautiful face as Lily. And as I was doing that, there was this flickering, like a, you take a light switch and you flick it on and off, on and off, on and off. So when the light was on, I would see Lily. And when, you know, was the other side of that flicker, I saw Lily as an adult. Only Lily wasn't Lily, Lily was Adam. So Adam is my adult son now. So in that time, Lily has recognized that she is not a she, she is a he and has transitioned. And I do have his permission to share that. Um, so that was, you know, such a beautiful thing to see. And in that moment, I fully and completely understood. I knew I had had hints when I was living on earth with Lily, which was Lily at the time, with Adam. Um, and, you know, that really helped with the transition. Then for me as a mother, you know, having that, there's a grieving process there when your child transitions. And, um, you know, I, I had had the hints and then I had had this experience. And so that was such a, a beautiful thing to have that gift in that moment. And then it was the same with Caroline, that when I would look at Caroline's face, I would see little Caroline sitting there, but then I would see Caroline as an adult. And when I saw Caroline, she was wearing, um, you know, like a hospital nursing doctor outfit. And uh, sure enough, she wants to be a physical therapist. So we'll see <laughs> if she's in high school, if she sticks with that, because we all have free will, but yeah, and um, since then, I've bumped into other people who've had a similar experience with when they saw their family members, they saw that that flickering going on. Um, so uh, I'm in this space. I looked back and I, you know, I realized, whoa, I think I'm dead. You know, that Angela moment of, okay, I left my body, reconnecting with my humanity. I saw my family there. I saw my children and my husband through the portal, and I could do that anytime I thought of them. That portal would open, I would see them, and then when I changed my thoughts to something else or had a question, the portal would close. Okay, so um, then whenever I would think of something, so either remembering who I was or Make, you know, making that connection of, wow, this is our true home. This is where I'm really from. I'm really this love-based, non-human entity, soul, whatever terminology you prefer to use. Um, I would connect to things about that, which I'll explain in just a second. If I had a question about something, so, you know, my human self would say, whoa, whoa, wait about, what about this? This is what would happen. I, in the moment, the way it felt to me is that I was standing in this kind of, the way it felt was linear. So when I think about it from the human side, it was this linear portal, if you will, that was all of knowledge, source, cosmic consciousness. There are a lot of different terms for it. And whenever I would remember something, I would kind of, it's like my body stayed there, but my brain, if you will, is, you don't have terms here, right? It's ineffable, um, would go off into this all-knowing knowledge. And I would revisit that. So I would revisit a past life. I would go off and see some other dimension. I would go and visit another of myself. So I'm going to share a little bit about that. So um, I went to see two of my other selves. 
there's for me no time and no space that we would recognize as time and space like we have it here in the dimension where I went when I had my NDE. And from that place of no time and space, then I can't really make a judgment about the time and space where these two entities were other than based on intuition. So the first entity that I connected with, my other self, really, that's the way I prefer to say it, the other other self I connected with um, was an ant-like entity. That's the best way to describe it based on earth terms. Um, so I was whisked off down this portal. It's like um, like a Star Trek episode when they go into you know the hyperspace and the lights are going past like this, like that. And then I just came up into this black velvety void space over the shoulder of this other self. I didn't see anything around this other self, so no room. You know, no floor, no space, no earth-like structures, just my other self. The black velvety void there was a little more dark char charcoal-y gray, a little more movement to it, softness to it, than the black velvety void I was in when I entered this dimension that I'm in. And this entity, my other self, felt very tall, like eight, 10 feet tall compared to ourselves. Um, a very long face, rusty red face, rusty red body, what appeared to be an exoskeleton um, antenna that were moving softly of their own accord, it would seem. Um, big, beautiful, round eyes, very dark. So very circular, seemed to be like a, a mound. And the reason I say that is you know, when you look at something that's wet, it has the reflection of light in it, in those little half moon shapes or quarter moon shapes. And I was able to see that. Um, the other interesting thing about this particular self is that the body was it felt softer and more human, like a cross between a human and an, an insect. So a thorax, but it felt more soft than human, an abdomen. And then the abdomen was more on an angle like this. And then the body was up like this, the head at the top. But the legs, you know, when we stand as a human, if our face is pointing that way, right, our knees bend like this, that was, it was the opposite. So the legs came down and the knees went the opposite direction like that. It was all very quick. So it was coming out of this tunnel-like space, coming in over the shoulder, a quick, oh, you're me, hey, and then back I went. So there wasn't any time really spent there connecting or talking or anything like that, but my other self seemed to turn and recognize me. There was definitely a lightning bolt moment of, ooh, hey, I know you. We're in the same lifespan, the same soul. We're sharing the same soul. And then I just immediately was kind of, whisked backwards again or what felt like backwards and then launched forwards again and then the next space I went to was the same way just this charcoaly black velvety void and within it I saw myself in another body this body was blue and humanoid and very soft the skin was very um, skin like uh, seemed very flexible but you know what I forgot to say is what I in, had through intuition of the um, red version of myself is that that was a male in another dimension. So not in this dimension, in a different dimension, male. Um, and I also had this intuition of a military-ish, um, very 
you know, strong, bold kind of personality. And then, so going back to this blue version of myself, uh, she, in this same dimension, very close to us where we are now, um, very soft features, uh, more, I don't want to say conehead, because if you've seen the conehead film, you'll, you'll think of a very high cone, not like that, softer, but much higher than we have as humans. Um, coming down softly, a very human-like eyes, uh, but blue, and a little bit, you know how ours come to a point at the end. Hers were a little more square, like this. Very soft nose, not this bony protrusion like we have, but softer so that the only recognition then was the shadow as it fell upon the face, you know, at the turn. Um, small lips, long nose, so long lips low down. Um, very, so what would be in the light was kind of a more foolish blue, a little bit of green to it. Uh, in the shadows, a little bit more of a cobalt or purple color. The beautiful part of it to me is that it was not so much shadow, but almost just a coloring of the skin, or perhaps the shadow works differently there, the light works differently, I'm not sure, but beautiful, very beautiful. Um, no signs of clothing, a smaller body, very, I saw shoulder, very small, thin shoulder. And again, just coming in over the shoulder, she turned and looked at me. We had that beautiful connection of, hey. <laughs> and then I was gone again, back to uh, that space where I started with my family. And then I would think of something else and away I would go. Another thing that I wanted to share with you that I encountered there is that um, I saw a future version of Earth. I, I don't exactly remember what took me to that. I was thinking about time and remembering, you know, oh, Earth has time and how time was working. And that's how I got there. But um it has to do with migration. So as I saw this future Earth, I saw a war. It, Earth looked very much like it does now, um, but it was like a third world war. So lots of countries fighting, a lot more fighting on American soil, um, in fighting on American soil, almost a little bit, you know, like a a civil war in a way pardon me, and also just across the globe. So, you know, when I say migration, that's not the only reason there was a war that I recognized through intuition for this particular war, but that migration was really at the core and center of all of the issues for this war. Um, fear and frustration being, you know, the driving point behind that, so the fear and frustration of being a migrant and having to leave your home, change your lifestyle, the fear and frustration of the people living in the space where the migrants are coming into and, you know, taking housing and food and all of that. And then the just general fear and frustration of not really having anything to do about it. So a lot of fear and frustration there on all sides and not... What I was seeing from the other side then is not taking that experience and creating love out of it. So what I saw from the other side of that was this opportunity to take migration, take these new people coming into your culture and to love them and merge them and become this one new culture, you know, to make it a beautiful moment of oneness and growing into a new humanity, a new earth. And that's not what was occurring. 
and also seeing that that's the the other choice you know the free will choice is to go towards love and making humanity this new it's not us and them it's not Europeans and Asians and Americans it's not races it's not males and females it's people all living together as one or continuing down this path of fear and frustration so I was able to see that but I was also just able to see the other side of that which seemed much farther in the future and that was having this future of complete oneness where business kind of disappeared and we all just supported each other and lived a life where everyone had what they needed by doing what needed to be done because it was the right thing to do, not because it gave you pride, not because it gave you a bigger house or a fancier car, but because it serves humanity. It serves the ultimate goal of that awakening, that enlightenment, that spirituality promises us, you know, the golden life here on earth where we're all truly and completely equal and living as one. So I, I was able to see kind of both sides of that. Um, and then I, you know, would go back to being in that central space with my family and I'd think of something else and away I would go or I would remember something else and away I would go. Um, and part of that was spurred on by a life review that was going on kind of, uh, you know, kind of started after I saw and was remembering myself. So going off and seeing my other selves, remembering myself, my life review started and I would see things in my life review and I would think, oh, wait, but what about this? What about that? So um, my life review compared to other life reviews you've heard was pretty standard. I was kind of locked in the space that I was in with my family in front of me. I hadn't moved in that space at all. Melanie was still beside me. But my life review was kind of back here and I would turn and watch it. And it's like it was on a movie screen, but there was no physical movie screen there. It was just showing in this space. Um, and I experienced um, probably most of my life, but, you know, more important moments, um, things that formed who I was, who I am today, um, things that, you know, were good and things that were bad. So little, little things, because you're viewing it from the other side. You're not, I wasn't viewing it as Angela human. I was viewing it as my soul self. And so watching it is entirely different. It's not, you're not viewing it and quote unquote, judging yourself the same way as you think that you would from here on earth. It's completely different. It's a completely different space, a completely different way of thinking. You're not clinging to time. You're not clinging to ego. You're not clinging to pride anymore. Those have all been let go. And I, no one was judging me at that point, except for the bit of humanity that still remained in me. For instance, I saw this moment where I was sitting in an intersection and I needed to pull out and there was a lot of traffic. So it was a left turn, waiting for a hole, it's rush hour, cars, 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 no break. And then I see this small spot and I'm thinking, and squeeze myself in there. I think I'm going to have to squeeze myself in there, but it's probably going to make the person, you know, behind me mad. And I did it. I pulled into traffic. And, you know, I remember doing it as a human. And I was like, oh, thank goodness. Now I can get home, right? Totally forgot about the person behind me. But from the other side, it was all about the other person. They were angry. They were not happy. I felt all that. 
I was them behind the wheel in their car driving. How is that even possible? Except that it is when you're on the other side, because it's a totally different set of physics, if you will, a totally different space, a way of interacting. And I felt terrible about it. Like, how can I do that? That was awful. I shouldn't have done that. I should have just waited my turn. So I was beating myself up, so to speak, about what seems like kind of trivial things here on earth for most of us. And then um, there were a lot of bigger things, like for instance, remembering some pre-birth planning. So my father was not a nice man to me. He was abusive. And I was able to see an answer to a lot of people who ask the question, why is there suffering here on earth? How can you have lo so much love and joy and peace on the other side and then have suffering here? It just, it's not logical. So this is what I experienced in my near-death experience. I saw that I planned to come here with my soul family. My father is a part of my soul family, just one member in my soul family. And we all were playing parts in this play, if you will. And I'm only using those terms because it's the best term to describe how it works from this side of the veil. So, um, let me pause for just a second with this. My understanding from all that and from my studies afterwards is that, you know, we, we live these multiple lives. We do it not always as the same person. So you know, sometimes I could be me and sometimes I could be my father and sometimes I could play, if you will, the person who is my mother. And the reason for that is to learn and grow and become, to learn and grow and become my soul, my individual soul, but to learn and grow and become all of us, to learn and grow and become the one, the cosmic source, the cosmic consciousness that is where we all originally extend from. So as we were planning this life together, I chose to play me, Angela, and come here. And here's the part about the suffering, to lovingly and graciously help the soul that is within my father grow and learn and become. So I chose, yes, I chose to suffer. But again, stepping back out of my human body, I made that choice from the other side where it's completely different than it is here. There is no time. This lifetime, instantaneous from the other side, very quick. The pain is a part of the growth. There is no pain on the other side. You know, like thinking back to my children, I saw my children's death. You know, I when I thought about leaving them behind, I was able to see what would happen to them if I stayed and didn't come back. And the pain, and I knew they would be there instantaneously. I knew that they were coming back to the space of love and light and peace and everything would be okay then. So, you know, when making these pre-birth plans, that's part of what went into it is just this completely different perspective that is so hard to get to from your human self, from your human body. So, um, yes, I saw that, you know, I made this decision to come here and live out this life with this part of my family to help my father to learn what it would be like to have these addictions, to help him learn to overcome those addictions. And my goal in that was to learn to use my voice and to speak out what, for what was right and just and true. And, um, you know, have my learning and growth occur through that. And eventually I did. Eventually that's what happened. Um, so it's just, you know, that 
whole part of that experience was so enlightening and helped me understand suffering from a whole different perspective, from the perspective of myself on the other side. And this interplay that we create with each other, which leads to that, and also the free will portion of that. You know, that's sometimes why we have to keep coming back is because we're using our free will in the moment. We're protected from our soul self living this human life, forgetting our true selves. And then free will becomes what can allow us to make these different choices. So I know our agreement to feel and learn and be challenged really comes through a lot of that free will. Um, so it was great to be able to see both points of view and to gain, engage and deeply, you know, learn from that experience. So really the part of the suffering there is learning to reconcile suffering with this other place that is all love and peace and happiness and to let go of our human ego, you know, to think of it as, to think of it from the other viewpoint, not from our ego-based viewpoint, and to reconnect with that loving space. Um, and then, you know, my life review continued, and it was similar in some spaces where I would have this, you know, just kind of momentary pause in the movie, if you will, and I would become this other person. I would understand what was occurring so much more deeply um, be able to see it from my soul self side of things rather than my Angela self side of things. Me. And that, you know, pain is a part of the process. Um, in my life review, as I got to the end of it, I definitely had a moment of reconnecting with my Angela self and thinking, <laughs> I did not do as good of a job as I wanted to. And I think I kind of delved down into my human self a little bit more. And I thought, well, maybe I should create a punishment for myself because that's what humans are supposed to do, right? You know, you did something wrong, you should suffer. But right in the, again, instantaneously, right? Like I'm thinking it, the thought is coming, but at the same time, here comes the answer. And I felt this enormous love from everyone around me, you know, that we're not judging you. You did a wonderful job. You helped us learn. You helped us grow. And this is a beautiful moment for everyone, this deep connection with each other. And I knew in that moment you know, no one around me, none of the souls that were there with me was judging me, that the only person judging me was Angela, like I mentioned before, that it was all me, as in the human side of me. And um, all the embarrassment and disappointment that I felt, and I did feel it in that moment, I had the exact same feelings that I have in my human body on the other side, even though I had left my body on earth. I'm not sure how that works. You know, and you can connect with me. Let's talk. But I definitely had those physical feelings of disappointment in myself, of embarrassment of behaving that way when I had such beautiful lofty goals when I was, you know, pre-birth planning and launching into my body. But I felt all these loving souls around me unconditionally loving me saying it's okay. So um, I then was having, you know, like seeing my family, thinking of them and how I was going to be leaving them behind. The portals opened. I saw my children again. It was the same way, this kind of flickering back and forth, seeing my husband in the um, hospital room. Um, and being able to see what was happening in the hospital room at the same time. And then 
at the same time, feeling the person who is there, who is the soul of my, who served as my mother-in-law here. She passed from lung cancer a few years before. And I'm thinking, as I'm seeing my family, thinking about my life review, I'm looking at Melanie, my life guide, and I'm thinking, I really want to stay here. This is so beautiful and so comfortable. I'm free from the pain and my family is going to be here instantaneously because there's no time. And I, I feel my mother-in-law's doing that. Uh-uh. <laughs> and Melanie is saying, well, you know, you get to make the choice. My mother-in-law says she has to go take care of the children. And I wake up on the tilt table in the hospital room. And it feels terrible. All I want to do is go back. I want to go back, go back, go back, go back. That's what my brain is doing. I want to go back. So I close my eyes really tight and I just hope, maybe I can go back. Maybe I can go back. And I feel my body and it's heavy and hot and tight and wet. It's so gross. And when I feel out into my body, it's just black. It's like my soul is trying to reconnect and it can see into my body, but it hasn't quite gone all the way out there to my arms and my feet yet. And so I just sit there with my eyes tightly closed and I hear the doctor say, she's back. And um, my eyes pop open for just a second. I see the nurse. She's got the paddles, <laughs> right? Literally like the paddles are right, right over my face. I close my eyes again. And I just laid there until I had this moment of, okay, I, I, have, to, I have to come back to this life. And I opened my eyes. I could see my husband um, kind of peeking around the doctor and, up and yeah I was back here so um I'm glad that I'm back I am I mean in that moment I really wanted to stay but I can see why I need to be back here I can see the path before me and how I'm you know there's importance to us all being here every one of us needs to be here every one of us needs to be doing what we're doing because you're here for a reason. Doesn't always feel that way, believe me. I'm there with you, but we are all here for a reason. And part of it is for me to share this information with you, to share that I had what can be described as an alien encounter during my NDE, and there was a deep spiritual component to it. That's a wonderful connection, and I hope that someone else out there finds hope and validation in that, that, you know, I had you know, this past life review. I had pre-birth planning in my experience that I connected with. And I am just really wanting to add that to the collective foundation of knowledge so that we can all share our experiences and each person's experience can be like a puzzle piece. And we put our puzzle pieces together and it helps us understand this other dimension. Thank you, Jeff. Angela, thank you for sharing your experience with us. If we go back to the beginning, you mentioned that you were with Melanie and you were continuing a conversation. Mm -hmm. Was that conversation being continued from your dreams or from the last time you were on the other side? That's a really great question. From my dreams, from this life. So... But, you know, I, I mentioned that now I have a continuing conversation with this soul, which allows me to call her Melanie and presents as a female to me. And that was a, con it's like, um, you know, when you're thinking to yourself and it's just kind of like that, it was like a continuous conversation where she was there. And, you know, we were talking about, <laughs> funny enough, you know, I even looked back over my shoulder. She was like, you know, well, you know, we're going to go and see your family and, you know, you'll be fine. And I was like, fine. Oh, oh yeah. I'm back on that 
table. And then we just continued on, you know, Marsha's waiting for you up there and that kind of conversation very every day. Is Melanie some type of non-human entity that doesn't incarnate and helps souls like us out on the other side? Or is she a member of your soul group? She's a member of my soul group. I've never encountered a moment with her that I feel like she would be, um, you know, outside of the soul group. So I think that wherever, you know, I go and the other people in my soul group go, she goes with us. So are you still connecting with her now through dreams? Yes. Mm -hmm. I also um, channel. I don't channel for other people, but um, yeah, I still, I talk to her very clearly this morning. Actually, it's funny. <laughs> right before I woke up. So when I went to bed last night, I thought to myself, I've got this interview. I need to get up. And this morning, right before I woke up, I had this. I heard my phone ringing. I had this image in my dream of my phone ringing. I picked it up. It was the front of my phone. And at the top, it said, Melanie, that Melanie was calling. It appears that you've been to two or three different black voids. In your opinion, what are they? Is it like a staging area or a place where you create things? That's a great question. I kind of refer to... Jim Brunton's book, The In-Between, it feels like an in-between space. So not exactly the same, but not a space where you stay and create. It's more, it, for, for me, it was more, you know, like visiting my other selves, almost as if they were, I don't know, you know, sometimes I think because I'm not there and I can't connect again and ask these questions to get that knowledge, pardon me, I have a hair on my face, um, that I was almost pulling them out of their space. So, uh, you know, if you think about astral traveling and leaving your body and going into this um, astral space, it, I kind of felt like in those two other spaces separate from the one where I left my body and I entered this other dimension that I was pulling them out for just that momentary glance out in an astral projection kind of way. And that charcoal I was seeing behind them was some veil, if you will. Could you consider when you were in the white light that was soft, a white void? Yes. I think that one could think of it that way. Definitely. Yeah. Like, a, you know, a lot of people talk about going into the white light space and yes, like a doorway almost. And when I talk about, sh you know, shooting off into these other places in this dimension, other dimensions. And when I say this dimension, I'm referring to the one that I'm sitting in right now. Um, it, that's like an entryway to all of that. And that I almost, you know, see it as if you come from a culture or a religion where you want to see a garden, that's the entrance to the garden. So if I wanted to see a garden, I could go and see a garden from there. If I, you know, wanted to instead see some sort of very futuristic world with lots of technology and purple skies, I, I could go and create a space like that or visit a space like that from there. So, you know, you mentioned was the Black Void a place of creation. I kind of have the intuition that that space that I was in is a space of creation and a portal, if you will. Would you say then that the white void is a place of healing? Yes. If it's a space of creation, yes, it would definitely be a space of healing. I've read quite a bit on how we go through different levels when we go home because, you know, mentally, if you will, our soul is still fragile from being here. And to arrive in a final place, 
which I don't think there is a final place. I think there's infinite growing and becoming and learning. But, you know, to go too far into that when you're not ready, it wouldn't be healthy. And so, yes, I do see that as a space of coming home, of remembering, of connecting, of healing. You had this memory with your uncle where you were on the motorcycle. And I think you had that probably like when you encountered him and hugged him. Is that the only memory that you had with him at that time? Or did you have multiple memories? I had multiple memories. I also remembered being in the kitchen. You know, we had, um, it was hot. It was a hot day. They didn't have air conditioning because it's Northern Michigan. And in the eighties, most people in Northern Michigan didn't have air conditioning. It was an exceptionally hot summer. In fact, my family had left Missouri because it was so hot. So we went to Northern Michigan to kind of escape the heat and visit our family there. And yeah, I remember being in the kitchen and the whole family, all my cousins around their big, you know, country style kitchen table and making potato salad and all those great summer American foods. So yes, lots of different memories. Do you think there are any reason why certain memories came forward? They were all good memories. So, you know, perhaps, I mean, we could say having that moment on the motorcycle of, you know, regrets and misunderstanding would be a negative thing, but it wasn't. It was a moment of growth and learning for both of us, really, right? I mean, when I talked about my dad, I talked about finding my voice and speaking up and I did it. You know, I had fear but I got on the motorcycle anyway, and I didn't say anything about it. And then I got on it, and I had to abort the mission and make my uncle feel bad. And that wasn't a good thing. But in other ways, it was because that was a marker for me of I need to speak up. And for him, I need to respect this intuition that I'm feeling that this child doesn't want to do this. So. One of your children transitioned to Adam. Have you considered or thought that the reason your child did this is because she's still holding on to being Adam or being male in a previous life? Yes, absolutely. I have considered that. Like I said, I we have had clues the whole time. The first haircut. So um, both of my children <laughs> were bald until they were probably you know, four and uh, I think it was about five or six years old, time to go to a hair salon and get the hair cut. And uh, we opened up one of those books that they have there where you can look at all the different hairstyles. And he chose a pixie. So the first, very first haircut he chose was a boy's haircut. When we would shop in the clothing stores, if we'd go to Target, I, uh, you know, as mom and having this little girl, I wanted the cute little skirts with all the flowers and pretty little shirts with the frills, but he would have none of it. He wanted the cargo pants so that he could stick rocks and sticks and, you know, frogs in them. So yeah, it was always there. You saw yourself as a blue being. You saw yourself as an insect-like being. Do you think that those other lives are happening at the same time? Yes, I believe they can be described as multidimensional parallel lives. And the reason for that is that there is no time on the other side. So everything is happening all at once. One of the things that I could see when I was standing in this all-knowing cosmic consciousness is all of time, all of it. So anything that we would place a future or history perspective upon standing in this space we're in right now, I could see all of it. And when I was with them, that felt as though it was now that they're, my soul is living multiple lives in multiple places, not all in the same dimension as this big blue ball that we're riding on right now. When you saw the future and the wars going on, do you think that future is something you're going to encounter during this incarnation? Yes. The war portion, the migration portion, yes. The unity portion of it seemed much more 
in the future. I didn't uh, access any dates, so to speak, you know, like human earth years. I didn't see anything like that attached to those when I um, thought about it. <laughs> the confusion of these experiences when I remembered it, um, it's, yeah, they seemed different, you know, that we'll have this war, but we'll eventually get to this space of unity. When you encountered yourself as a blue being and as an insect-like being, they seem to acknowledge you. Yes. Do you think other versions of ourselves, like those beings, ever visit us here? Yes, I do. Um, the Seth material talks a little bit about that. If uh, anyone wants to read you know, some connections to that outside of this conversation, yes. Um, you know, it going back to the astral traveling, um, having, you know, being a little more lucid during your dreaming and having these deep, deep states of your consciousness reconnecting with itself. And as it reconnects with itself, its core soul self, well, all these other soul selves are reconnecting with that core soul self. And at the same time, there's this interchange of information and connection and acknowledgement. Yes, I do believe that. I don't know if you're into ETs or not, but when you described yourself as being blue, some people may say that you were or are an Arcturian at that time. Has that word come across you? Yes, it has. Mm -hmm. Would you agree to that? I'm not sure. I mean, it seems that that could be the case. I haven't been able to study that as much as I would like to. Um, because I've been busy with raising those two beautiful kids and helping out IANS. But I definitely want to learn more about that and read more about that. And every person that I encounter who has had a similar experience talks to me about it. So it, it that helps me helps me find hope and validation in what I experienced and to start to tie those threads to understand that other part of myself and what I'm doing there. Even though you're in a place of immense love, after your life review, you still had some feeling of embarrassment and disappointment within yourself. Do you think all of us experience that after our life review and that's what drives us to come back? Perhaps. I can't speak for other people, but I could certainly see myself making that choice. Yeah. I think that, you know, we, I think that the veil is so heavy and we're so hidden from ourselves, from that love that it allows us to make these crazy choices. <laughs> that are embarrassing and that are disappointing and that are hurtful to the other people. And that, you know, there's always then going to be this desire to bring and be the true self that you are, to be that loving soul and to show that and shine that, it, you know, this, multi-million, probably billion-dollar industry of seeking enlightenment. I think that there's a lot of that behind it, right? That we know, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be saying this. I shouldn't be acting like this. I need to get back to that person, that soul that I know I am deep inside. We all know that that's in there because that's who we truly are. And I think that's the driving factor behind that. So couldn't we then flip that around and then say, you know, when we're on the other side, we're always wanting to contribute to the consciousness of the one. And we're always wanting to lovingly and graciously lift each other up and help the individual portions of our soul grow. So yeah, that completely makes sense to me. Do you think that there's an end point to coming back? Can you explain more? Do you feel like that at some point you've experienced everything there needs to be here and there's no mm -hmm. point in returning? I could see that. I didn't experience anything like that 
that I remember during my near-death experience. But yes, I, you know, from everything that I experienced and reading a lot, hearing a lot of other experiences, yes, um, I do feel that, you know, you can eventually reach this state where you go into another, your soul moves into another stage of soul life, if you will. But that you always, as this core central soul, have the ability to come back and relive lives on these other planets and these other dimensions, if that's what you choose to do, either for your own growth or the growth of the one, the all. You use the term core central soul. Would you say that's synonymous with higher self? Yes, I would. So I see it as, you know, our, we have, we come from, so Matthias De Stefano kind of talks about it too, that you come from this, the one, the all, the source, and it has divided itself in order to learn and grow and become. And those then divide more and more and more, and that we're a division of that one central core, but also, at least this is the way I understand it now, that then those souls can choose to go into different bodies at different times, which seem like parallel lives because there's no time. It gets very complicated. Besides having contact with Melody, did you get any other new abilities that you didn't have prior to the NDE? Oh, yes. Um, I, I am really connected now with spirit and nature. So I see myself as being both. You know, we're nature, we're here, we're in our bodies, and we have to honor that and live our lives as humans. And we have a duty to the people in our lives to be human and to be here and to not always be, you know, living in the light and spirit, pursuing enlightenment. We still have to do the laundry. still have to eat. We still have to do all of those things that we need to do. And in that, you know, we're also source. So we still need to have a part of our lives where we're connecting with source and remembering who we are and keeping that channel open. And so I've learned to, you know, make that just a part of my day. So all day long, I'm kind of in meditation in a way, you know, thinking about having that channel open, making sure that I'm trying to live my life through the love and peace and calm and unity of who I truly am in connection with uh, nature. But in that connection with source, I'm also in some ways, you know, I don't want to say controlling or manipulating nature, but here's an example. Um, I follow Self-Realization Fellowship, and they have a convocation every year, and it was my first year. I was doing convocation. I was sitting upstairs in this house. It was the, the beginning of the pandemic, so we were all in the house together, and I had moved my office into our bedroom, I'm sitting at the desk, listening to convocation. And I hadn't really gotten involved deeply with IANS yet. I didn't have a community. I was just reading and listening and you know, kind of on the fringe and trying to connect because I had, after my experience, it's a PTSD experience. You died. It's hard. It's hard to come back from that. There are the health issues. Then you have to go home and live your life, go back to work, take care of your family. So for a couple of years there, I was just living. Then we moved. So we moved from Texas to North Carolina. And it was after that, that I was able to finally settle down and start looking into what is this? What happened to me? So I'm sitting there at the table, listening to convocation and having a bit of an existential moment of, am, am I on the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Just not sure. And now I had been looking out this window for hours 
up at, in between these trees. So it's a two stands of trees that come together and there are openings between the trees. I had looked there many times and the shyness of the trees is kind of random, right? But after this existential moment, I look up and all of those openings had turned to hearts. So I even have pictures. And over the years, that has kind of grown together and gotten a little shifty and you can see them as well. And so I was sitting there this spring thinking, oh man, I wish those hearts would come back because really liked that. You know, and that was a, a reminder every morning when I would sit down to do my meditations. Source is here with you. You can see it. It's right there. And um, you know, like I said, they were gone. There was no heart. I had carefully looked. And then uh, one of my friends whom I had just talked to two days before passed, transitioned. And I think that he played a part in it. I looked up and I have a picture of it. I wish I could pull it up for you. There is a perfect heart there right now. You can go see it for yourself. I mean, it's one of those like perfect Valentine hearts, you know, with the big fat top on it. And it comes around and has a perfect little point. And these are trees that are full grown oak trees. So this heart is 75 feet in the air and it's formed from multiple trees, branches. So it's not just one tree. It's eight different trees that have created this space of a heart. So, yeah, I definitely feel that since my, my experience, I am so much more in touch with spirit and talking with spirit, talking with Melanie, talking with my soul family through meditation and just my heart being connected, my soul being connected in a way that I'm not sure I really would have ever had before. I think that the NDE was a catalyst for really opening myself back up to all of that and awakening. From what you can remember, do you feel that this realm or the other side is more dreamlike? The um, other side is vibrant and realer than real it's when you're there you know and when you come back it's like being in a fog it's it's the, this is the dream state for sure have the memories of your nde faded over time yeah mm -hmm. and i would say as i listen to other people's narratives and you know, listen to podcasts. I have moments of reconnection and remembering, you know, when I came back, uh, that veil descended again. And you know, I, I have those strong memories from it, but I also have moments of, oh, wait, aha, uh -huh, okay, this helps me connect these things. So, yeah, I mean, they say that that's one of the hallmarks of a near-death experience is that you carry those memories with you clear as a day your whole life. And yeah, I can attest to that. What inspires you about your NDE? Hmm, what inspires you? I, remembering and reconnecting with this love and peace and understanding of how we're all here together. So um, right when Adam was born, we moved to Germany. We were expats for two years. It was a wonderful experience, also very hard. There was a lot of crying and anguish because you're moving to a foreign country and it's very, very different. Um, but when you're there, you're connecting with all of these other expats from all different nations and you're there together and it's like being in a lifeboat, right? Like you're all having the same experience and you're able to sit down and you're able to talk about it and make all these connections and understand yourself better through those connections. And, you know, I, I kind of liken it to that. Angela, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Yes. Absolutely. I see this as a continuing conversation. So 
So anytime you have a question, whether you are watching it for the first time or you're going back and revisiting five years from now, if you have a question, I would love to talk to you about it because we are all here together. We all are learning and growing together. And the only way to do that is to talk about it, to have conversations about it. What's the best way to reach you? By email, um, you can reach me at Angela at IANS.org. But perhaps that's no longer a valid address if I were to leave IANS for some reason. Can't imagine. But if it were to happen, it's kind of a crazy email address, but it's email Angela Harris at gmail.com. As in you spell out email, E-M-A-I-L. And then my name, A-N-G-E-L-A-H-A-R-R-I-S at gmail.com. Does IONS have any things that are upcoming that we should know about? Yes, we have a conference in the fall. It's a big bubble of love, and I recommend that everyone come and enjoy that community. It's an incredibly warm, welcoming space where you can sit down across from someone and talk about all of this openly. Everyone shares. It's there. You know how you might try talking about this kind of stuff with your family or your friends and you'll get the look and you know you maybe should stop what you're saying. That doesn't happen there. You can just keep on going and people are adding to it. And the conversation just rolls. There are great talks, workshops, um, fun activities, parties. It's really a wonderful event. But also, IANS has really expanded over the years. Um, I help run the groups and events. So we have webinars every Saturday on all topics spiritually transformative. And then we also, most importantly, have sharing groups. So those are every Sunday in the morning and in the evening. And again, it's a space where you can virtually come and join other people who are talking about their spiritually transformative experiences. They're curious about um, where did their loved one go? They're grieving. Um, we do have people who come who are suicidal and want to know what will happen to them if they act upon that. Um, so it's a broad community of people who've come for different reasons, but everyone who comes finds love and hope and validation. Angela, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Be kind to each other. That's the most important message of all. I know a lot of people say it coming out of the near-death experience, but I can tell you from personal experience, living right now, even after my near-death experience, it's harder than it sounds. So just like when you're going through a meditation class and, you know, it, let's say it's a mindfulness class and you need to focus on your breath, right? And your mind wanders and you just bring yourself back to your breath. You're like, oh, started planning my day. I need to come back to my breath. Be kind like that. So have that, you know, as your goal. And then, you know, someone, that guy shows up and like you're like, Arr! and you're starting to get those feelings. Just like your mindfulness meditation, just bring yourself back and be kind like a wave, right? always coming back to be kind, be kind to yourself, but also be kind to other people. You can be kind to yourself first and forgive yourself for those feelings, bring yourself back around. Then it's easier to spread that kindness out in the rest of the world. Angela, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you for hosting me and letting me talk today. It's been wonderful. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.